we're in uh, part two of the message. We're in Romans 14, continuing our study in the book of Romans. And uh, in chapter 12, we hit the practical uh, section uh, of the book uh, where Paul says, I beseech your brothers uh, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him, which is your spiritual act of worship. Uh, in other words, uh, understanding all the doctrinal things that he's covered that were, were justified by faith, uh, that uh, God's spirit is in us doing a work conforming us to the, uh, the image of Jesus Christ, uh, that uh, there's no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Chapter 8, beginning at the end, and nothing can separate us from the love of God. And then 9, 10, and 11, the uh, illustration of Israel itself in terms of God's faithfulness uh, and uh, understanding all of that. Uh, Paul says, it's the, in a sense, it's the least we can do is to have our lives dedicated to the Lord to say we're, we're all in in this thing of the kingdom of God and, and serving him. Uh, he says, and then, and then uh, if we are in the word and having our minds renewed, we won't be pressed into the mold or the pattern of this world. And he talked about what, uh, what genuine love is, covered some other subjects. But as we got to chapter 14, uh, we got to this area of when we disagree. And it's not when we disagree doctrinally. It's not when we disagree over the essentials of the faith. Uh, it's when we disagree about, he uses the term, doubtful things, things that are basically, uh, we might say, cultural adaptation. You know, what's okay for you, uh, somebody else is freaking out about, uh, you know, kind of thing. Uh, can a Christian really have, uh, you know, their whole body covered in tattoos? See, there's some people that have a problem with that. There's others that's like, well, that's normal. What are you talking about? You know, it's, uh, you know, we, there's a lot of variety. These are the kind of things we're talking about. And, uh, uh, and Paul says there are some things that we should be thinking through, thinking about when we have these little disagreements because the idea of the body of Christ is uh, unity, not uniformity. <laughs> We're all not supposed to look the same, same haircuts, dress the same, same shoes. Uh, again, that's the military, but that's not supposed to be. What it, but I've been to churches. That's what it looks like. I mean, it's like, wow, I didn't know you had to have pair of pants like that and a shirt like that. It's uh, like I'm the only guy here in a shirt sleeve shirt. Uh, there's some churches that are like that. It's, and it's kind of a cultural thing. Uh, and Paul's saying uh, that, uh, and that's okay, uh, except that with our own convictions and the way we are culturally as cultural Christians, we still need to be able to have uh, this, this unity uh, even amongst the diversity. And uh, as we were uh, worshiping uh, in the first service, I was just thinking about a friend of mine that uh, went in uh, Northern California, took over a, a church there. He was a Calvary guy and um, been pastor in a long time. This church was uh, uh, lot, like millions in debt, a uh, huge facility and very few people. And, uh, and so basically they uh, uh, asked Pastor Chuck, hey, can you send somebody up here and kind of help us out here? And Anyway, uh, this guy did. He went up there and uh, aging congregation kind of was there a couple Sundays and then uh, met, said, just want to meet with everybody, which he did. Uh, and he said, uh, he said, how many of you have uh, uh, children or grandchildren that are not saved, but you want to see them saved? Of course, that's, that's everybody. He says, okay, this, that's what we're going to do. Uh, does everybody want to do it? Yeah, yeah, man, I want to see my kids and my grandkids. Yeah, that's right. Okay, here's what we're going to do then. Uh, next week, we're going to have a band. Uh, up here instead of the uh, the piano ladies tree, trio thing going very sweet ladies but we're gonna have a band uh, and I would suggest that you get some of those foam earplugs because it's gonna be really loud and because uh, we could everybody wants to see their kids and grandkids get saved right so we're all okay with this and uh, and you're gonna be okay uh, when they come in their jeans and no shoes and t-shirts and, uh, and whatever and they got you know 12 uh, piercings in different places you're okay with that because we want we're trying to see them get uh, get saved and, uh, and then what I, I want you to do also is uh, bring some $20 bills uh, in your uh, wallet, in your purses, because uh, you're going to see some young moms come in here. There's some of them 20 years old with a couple of kids. And what you're going to do is walk up and try to hold their baby and give them a break. And when they're not looking, you're going to shove 20, 40 bucks in that diaper bag because you can remember when you were like that at that age. And you're going to do these things and we're going to make these changes because we all said we're all in to see our kids and our grandkids get saved. Is everybody okay with that? And you know, pretty much they were. He could have done something else. He could have said, starting next week at 8.30, we're going to have a traditional service. And then at 10.30, we'll have a contemporary service. He could have done that. Just, we'll just divide because we don't want to bother each other. But uh, I think he did the better thing. 
which said, if we're really mature in the Lord, and we're growing in the Lord, and the litmus test, that we really love other people, then, then we're, we're going to be accepting uh, of other people. That's kind of where we were last week, because those first 12 verses dealt with attitude, our attitudes in these things when we disagree. Uh, we're going to see uh, in the last uh, half, verse 13 to uh, 23, it really deals more with action. Our actions uh, can be a problem uh, or a blessing as, as well. Uh, now, it, it all kind of, on one side, you have a, a bent towards legalism, the other side towards liberty. And there's got to be a balance uh, between uh, these two things. Uh, Paul says in Galatians 5.1, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. Uh, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. We're not, we're, you know, Paul's saying, I'm, I'm not dragging us all back into legalism, because in that historical context, you have a church in Rome that is predominantly uh, Jewish, but obviously has Gentiles. And we can understand as we went through, <laughs> the Jewish guys would have just a little, just a little bit towards uh, uh, legalism. Like, it's important the day. It's important that we... Don't eat meat that's been sacrificed to the idols. Not exactly kosher. And, uh, and it was a problem. Those were those issues. Uh, those are probably not our issues today. It's, it's, uh, it's other things. We also talked about the three Greek words that are used in the New Testament for judging. And we actually covered this on Wednesday night because we happen to be in Matthew 7. Where Jesus uh, uses the Greek word krino, which means to render a final verdict. And there he says... Do not crino. Do not judge, lest you be judged. Uh, and we talked about the fact that that's the non-Christian's favorite Bible Bible verse. I don't know how they know it, but anytime you see something about their behavior, it's, "Hey man, don't judge me." You know the Bible says, "Don't judge." How do they know that? I don't know how they know that verse. They, they all know that verse. And uh, and Jesus says, "Yeah, none of us are in a position to know another person's heart. We cannot render a final verdict." So what, uh, what we have later in the New Testament is a preposition is added onto that, so we get diacrino, and that was the question. You ask questions, find out what's going on, so you can render a verdict in terms of discernment. And actually, uh, last week we went through uh, areas where we're not to judge, uh, and then uh, Wednesday night we went through, and here are the things we're to judge over. I think we covered uh, uh, diacrino things where we can have discernment by asking questions and, uh, and so forth. And we mentioned last week, it's even a gift of the Spirit, the idea of discernment. And then the anacrino, which means, again, a process we go through to try to determine right from wrong and so forth. And we all ought to be able to do that. So we are to judge, not in an actual condemnation of somebody, to say, I'm pretty sure that guy is not going to heaven, he's going to the other place, boom, render a final verdict. And Paul uses the same term here a little bit when he says... Uh, do not judge in certain areas, uh, diacrino. In other words, don't be asking questions trying to come to a conclusion about somebody else's personal convictions. Uh, don't do that. You've got your personal convictions? Great. Keep them to yourself, in a sense, is what he's saying. Uh, you know, at the same time, we'd say, you know, hopefully maybe one of the takeaways from this is that, well... <laughs> I think this other person is doing something that actually is causing problems in his life and other people's lives. What should I do? Well, here it is. Pray that they be filled with the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. Because that's it. Uh, this is the motivation. You know, if our relationship is right with the Lord uh, and we're filled with God's love, hey, a lot of this other stuff is going to take care of itself. That was our first three principles. We're to accept one another and accept one another in love when we disagree. When we disagree, we need to make sure our allegiance belongs completely to the Lord Jesus Christ, that we're committed to, to the Lord. Uh, and then realize, Paul said, that, well, you know, in the end, all of us are accountable to, to the Lord. So uh, that takes us to verse 13 and point four. Now, I'm just mentioning this in case you drift off, because if you drift off and you wake up and I'm on like point five, you're going to panic, because it's like, man, he's already covered four points. <laughs> How long have I been dozing here? And so we're, we're actually just pointing that out in case somebody drifts off here. We're starting actually on point four, verse 13. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. So certainly our actions, things we do, can cause others to stumble in the faith. Uh, notice uh, we'll see words like stumble, grieve, uh, even destroy others by our actions. 
Uh, stumbling block means something that's carelessly left. It's carelessly left. It's not intentional. It's like, uh, it's like your kids' toys that are left across the living room and you get up in the middle of the night to uh, go to the bathroom or something. You, uh, you step on those little metal cars. They're, they're just a killer, right? The arch of the foot. I got a tip for you as a grandfather, though. I now rubber, wear rubber house slippers in the house, and that, that helps, man. I, I've stepped on those things and went, that wasn't too bad, you know? <laughs> just a little tip. Uh, things that are, it's not intentional. Uh, there's things that we can do that actually unintentionally cause someone to stumble uh, in their faith in Jesus Christ. The other term that's used is obstacle. That means something deliberately left in order to ens uh, ensnare. So that uh, as believers, uh, when we disagree, one of the issues is, well, it's an attitude check that we should have. But in our actions, we can unintentionally and sometimes intentionally do things that actually cause other people to to stumble in, uh, in their faith. Uh, we also said that when he addresses the weaker, the weaker brother, uh, the weaker brother is not somebody that's weak in faith. Uh, the weaker brother may have tremendous ability and faith to, to believe and trust God. Uh, your kid's sick and you want prayer, that may be the guy you want praying because he, he believes and trusts the Lord. That's not what we mean by weak in faith. It uh, does also mean it, it's not the person who's weak in terms of their moral life. They may, may have a, 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 a right-on moral life that they lead uh, before God and before others. It means weak in faith in terms of this idea of being saved by grace and by grace alone. Uh, there's, there's this little tendency to think, I've got to keep doing stuff, uh, meeting on a certain day, whatever it might be, in order to stay right with God, uh, kind of a thing. We're not talking about sin. We're not talking about things covered in the Bible. It's this other stuff. It's these, quote, cultural adaptations. Uh, that's the problem. A definition of legalism is it's setting standards that do not correlate to Scripture. It's setting rules and regulations that we've made up ourselves and cannot be supported by a particular Scripture uh, in, in the Bible. Legalism. Uh, we don't want to fall into legalism. Uh, liberty. What's liberty? Well, that's the other side. Uh, some would say liberty is uh, knowing that I can do anything I want. No, <laughs> that's not liberty. The liberty is to know that I am completely free in Jesus Christ. I am free to serve him to the best of my abilities. Uh, that's liberty. I don't have to be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world. I can be transformed from it by the renewing uh, of our minds. I am free to not live the way other people in the, in the world live. I am free to raise my kids differently from them. I'm free to have different priorities. I don't even have to dress uh, like them, look like them or whatever. I just am free to do whatever I want. I don't have to you know, chase the dream and have the big house and the, the big car, especially if it's a big pink car. I'm just kidding. There's a, <laughs> the most outrageous Cadillac sitting in our parking lot. You might want to check that out later. I, otherwise, you'll see it on Facebook if you're, uh, if you're my friend because it's going to be up there. But, uh, you know, there's... Uh, you know, there's things we just caught up in the stuff, uh, you know, and uh, the stuff is okay, uh, but we're free from all, all of that, and, uh, and that's a wonderful thing. So there's a balance between legalism uh, and liberty, because as Paul's saying here, when we love others, we're all about building them up. Now, uh, the parallel passage is 1 Corinthians 8 and 9, where Paul's dealing with the same subject, uses the same terminology, uh, and there in Corinth, uh, it was a place of uh, uh, you know, a lot of temples, uh, a lot of idols that were worshipped. Uh, we mentioned before that uh, when the animal was sacrificed to uh, Zeus or Apollos or whatever it might be, uh, then the priest would take his little portion uh, and then it would be taken very close proximity to the, uh, the meat market. Uh, and then you would, it would be labeled which idol it had been sacrificed for. And the reason uh, they did that is because they could charge more because... What got sacrificed was the best meat, the choice meat. So if you wanted the, the best meat, of course, today you just go to Costco. They carry choice beef. Another little tip, no charge. Uh, but uh, uh, then you, would, you wanted to buy the meat sacrificed to the idol, uh, which is no problem. If you're the Gentile, you're a run-of-the-mill pagan, you get saved, and you, don't, you don't care. You're eating the stuff your whole life. But if you're Jewish, this is a, little, this is a problem. This is a problem. I mean, they, they're only going to, they're going to still try to eat uh, kosher, uh, which they probably should, uh, and uh, try to live before the Lord. So it's a real, it's a real conflict. So Paul's dealing with that uh, in, the, in the church in Corinth, 
uh, and uh, he says in uh, chapter 8, verse 1 there, Now concerning things offered to idols, we know that we uh, have all knowledge. Uh, we know that we all have knowledge, and knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. Uh, it's, it's great knowing and having the knowledge that this is nothing, and we're okay, and we're free uh, to eat whatever we want to eat. Uh, but at the same time, it's love that actually builds uh, or edifies uh, other people. Uh, in Galatians 5.13, he says, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. So it's, it, it's a balance. How do we balance uh, these two things? Simply if we uh, love others. That'll be the preeminent thing, and it won't be an issue. Uh, later in chapter 8 of 1 Corinthians in verse 7, he says, However, uh, there is not in everyone that knowledge for some with consciousness of the idol, and to now eat it as a thing offered to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. It's like, man, I know that that thing's been offered to an idol, and know oh, that's probably bad, and I'm going to eat it anyway. Well, that's not good. Shouldn't, shouldn't be doing that. Uh, but food that does not commend us to God for Neither if we eat are we the better, nor if we do not eat we are the worse. Uh, but beware lest somehow this liberty of yours becomes a stumbling block. That's our term to those who are weak. I realize this is not an issue with everybody, the whole meat thing. But you get the idea. It's like for some people to do something according to their conscience, they probably shouldn't be doing it. <laughs> and, but they go ahead and do it anyway. That's not good. They should live according to their, their, own, their own convictions. Not according to the things mentioned in the Bible, but these just peripheral gray, uh, gray areas uh, and, uh, and so forth. Uh, but uh, to some people, it's like it's no big deal. So it's, uh, it's not a problem. Now, he goes on in the chapter and he gives an example. Uh, and he says, so if you go to someone's house, uh, it's your uh, neighbor down the street. He's not a believer. He has you over for dinner. Uh, and he's going to serve uh, ribeye. And you're thinking, wow, those look pretty good. You're out there around the grill in the backyard. I'm not sure if they did that in Corinth, but they had to cook it somehow. And, uh, and they're out there doing that. And then the guy says to you, by the way, this is the best meat I could get. In fact, this was a uh, sacrifice to Zeus just this afternoon. Paul says, bummer. See, because uh, he says, you should have a don't ask, don't tell policy. And what you don't know ain't going to hurt you, you know. But once he tells you, don't eat it. Now, he's, he's already said the meat is nothing. The issue is you want to see that guy get saved. He might see you as a compromiser at that point. And that would keep him from coming to faith in Christ. Does that make sense? It's really nothing. You're concerned about whether he gets saved or not. You're worried about does he see you as being someone that compromises their convictions, compromises their faith. Their faith really doesn't mean anything to it. Is that the way he would take it? So really, it's, it's all about our attitude towards other people. What do they think about us? Well, I don't care what they think. Well, no. <laughs> See, that's the problem. We should. We need to care what other people think because we want them to come to faith in Jesus Christ. You know, that, that's why the, this is a love issue. You know, how much do we really love the Lord? How much do we really love other people? I'll, I'll, be, very, I'll be a little more conscious of stuff uh, that I'm doing because uh, my actions uh, actually... We sometimes say, speak louder than words. Uh, and people are, are watching. For example, this is just me. This is just me, for example. <laughs> I've never been in Tamuras. I understand they have really good, I've eaten their pokey before. I can tell you they have pretty good pokey. Uh, but I've never been in there. Why? It's like, well, here's the door to the church. Here's the door to the liquor store. I think if it said Tamuras Delicatessen, I probably would have already been in there. I might be in there quite a bit. But it doesn't. It says liquor store. And it's, I used to, I've run liquor store. I've, you know, I've worked for Safeway. I did all that stuff. But as the pastor of the church, I just think, I think that maybe, that maybe somebody might be driving by, going by with their Safeway cart, riding their skateboard or whatever, and they know that I'm the pastor of the church. And I'm, here I am. Is he going to the church? No, going to the liquor store. <laughs> I'm buying potato chips. Come on. I just walk down the Safeway and buy the potato chips. Uh, it, I just don't want to, I don't want to take a chance. It, it, you know, there's nothing, nothing wrong. And, uh, and uh, you know, with going in there per se, I, but I, I'm just kind of concerned. Well, brother, don't you have the liberty? Yeah, but I, I you know, but I don't want to flaunt it. I want to see, you know. I'm, I'm concerned about other people coming to the Lord. That, that's what Paul's talking about here. It's that kind of stuff. And we could be talking about a myriad of different kind of issues. Uh, but 
you know, the, the Lord, the Holy Spirit will, you know, he'll help us in these areas. Should I be doing this? Is this an issue? Is that a problem for someone? Uh, you know, I mean, you know, and again, we don't want to fall into the legalism thing. You know, I saw you go into Murrah's the other day. What were you doing? You know, it's <laughs> you just find a soda. You know, it, we're, it's not jump on the bandwagon and now I don't do it. So you shouldn't. It, it's it's just trying to live our lives out before others in love is really, really the issue. This is where it all climaxes in a very familiar verse to us when Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, 22, to the weak, that's what we're talking about, to the weak I became as weak that I might win the weak. I've become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. I'm not going to save everybody the best I can by my actions, by my behavior. I'm going to kind of watch it. So when I'm around all the Gentiles and they're having pork chops for dinner, man, I'm having pork chops. Those are awesome. Way to go. Spare ribs tomorrow night. But when I'm with a bunch of uh, Jewish guys and Paul's like, no, hey, yeah, we're absolutely kosher here. He's not being a hypocrite. Uh, he's, he's just trying to do what he needs to do in his cultural adaptations as a missionary to win people to faith in Jesus Christ. In a sense, we're all missionaries. <laughs> and we're, we're, we're diverse enough. Uh, here, here in the islands and even in the body of Christ, uh, that we need to, uh, again, to the weak become weak, that we might win the weak. The problem here, again, is the, uh, the weak Christian. And it's interesting because the weak Christian is not the new Christian. The new Christian doesn't care. They're just saved. They're just stoked they're going to heaven. They never even thought about it. They never even thought about whether they should go to a liquor store or, or, or any of these other things. They're just happy they're saved. It's not the person that's a new Christian. The weak Christian is uh, guys like me. <laughs> you know, where we've been around a few decades walking with the Lord, we get kind of settled in and get pretty firm on our own convictions and, uh, and so forth. We're the ones that really have to be, uh, be a little more, more careful. Uh, the guy that's a brand new Christian that's 19 years old doesn't give a thought to the guy next to him that's uh, got... 12 piercings and 18 tattoos. It's like, cool. Uh, where, where'd you have that done? You know, of course, all the guys that are squirming, they have tattoos right there. That, yeah, it's not the issue. Uh, it's like, in fact, God bless you because if you didn't have them and somebody came in, they wouldn't feel comfortable. So God bless you because we're trying to reach everybody. And uh, that, you understand? It, it's just about winning people to faith in Christ. But it's, it's the older, it's like, you've got what? You know, you know. <laughs> yeah. See, that's. The, the person that says, and they did what? That's the weak Christian. <laughs> that's the weak Christian. And she wore what? That's the weak Christian. Uh, that, that's the idea. Uh, that, that's where the problem is. Our actions do impact the lives of others. And love needs to be, uh, again, the guiding directive. Uh, five, and if you just woke up, you missed like the first, we're almost done. <laughs> we must make every attempt to walk in love. Verse 14, I know and am convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it's unclean. Yet if your brother is grieved because of your food, notice what you can do, you can grieve someone, you are no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let your good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. Again, in our attempt to walk in love, first we're saying that uh, we need to see that, uh, you know, Things are, you know, inanimate objects uh, are kind of neutral. Food, drink, so forth. There's no, nothing moral about a tuna fish sandwich. Are we, are we okay? A piece of broccoli is just a piece of broccoli, is what Paul is saying here. Uh, no moral qualities. Uh, but what something does to a person determines its quality. Uh, if, if it makes a person stumble, that, uh, that top sirloin that you're eating, well, that becomes an issue. You know, I made the joke about... Uh, <laughs> eating breakfast with David Hawking having Portuguese sausage who's now he was just kind of joking but you, you see the problem uh, it's not a problem uh, for me uh, it's the problem is what it might do to someone else who because it's a problem for them uh, in that case if if, uh, if they're Jewish I talked about meeting with the uh, pastor of the Seventh-day Adventist Church I just have a salad 
because they don't eat meat. It's not, it's not an issue. I don't, I'm not going to order a big steak and go, got the liberty here, you know. The Bible's pretty clear on this, you know. You know what Paul says, don't you? you know? yeah. Paul says, that's wrong. That's wrong. Uh, you, you see the idea? Uh, again, it's, uh, uh, the second thing is, as we attempt to walk in love, we must not destroy our brother because of food. Uh, again, uh, verse 15, yet if your brother, notice, grieved because of your food, do not destroy uh, with your food. Well, pretty heavy terms. You can grieve, you can destroy. Uh, the term your food, uh, the way it's stated there, alludes to uh, an insistence on something regardless of the consequences, the idea of flaunting it, like, uh, like I was just uh, uh, talking about there. Paul's kind of horrified by that thought. Uh, the key there, again, verse 15, are we acting in love or not? Uh, I know young guys, uh, godly guys, that, um, that are uh, you know, 20-somethings and some 30-somethings that I know you're just going to be shocked by this statement, but they don't have the Internet, and they don't have smartphones because they don't want to get stumbled by it. Because uh, there's upwards of about 70% of the guys in this country that view pornography. And it's destroying marriages across, across the country. And uh, uh, it's a terrible thing because the images imprint on the mind. And there's this thinking that, well, you know, I can ask the Lord to forgive me and he'll, say, he'll forgive me. He will. But the, you've already been imprinted with the information. That's the problem. <laughs> And, and, uh, and these guys are saying, I, I don't even want to go there, so I'll just do without it. No, man, here's my smartphone. See, that's why I got a Bible here. I got a little concordance. Hey, you can go. Don't do that. That's what Paul's saying. Don't do that. They have a conviction about something. They're trying to live for the Lord. You don't have to fix them. <laughs> just let them live out their, their conviction. It's not an issue to you. Praise God, it's not an issue to you. Uh, if it becomes one, uh, then you need to uh, maybe get some help and, uh, and deal with it. But exercising Christian living, liberty, again, is much like walking a, a, a tightrope. I don't know if you saw the, uh, the Christian guy that crossed the Grand Canyon on the tightrope and one of the, one of the Valentas, the, the circus guys. It was like, I never even heard of that. It was just a couple of months ago. It was in the news. I guess I watched the news. But, uh, okay, praise the Lord. Somebody's shaking their head. He actually saw this. I thought it was a big deal. But anyways, he walked across the Grand Canyon on the type rope, he had that beam, and that, that helps steady himself. And in a sense, that's what Paul's talking about. There's Christian liberty on one side, because we're not, we're under the new covenant, the blood of Jesus. We're not actually under the Mosaic covenant anymore. Uh, so we've got our liberty here, and we've got love over here. And those two things need to balance out each other. Uh, Martin Luther, in his treatise on the freedom of a Christian man, said, a Christian man is a most free Lord of all, subject to none. A Christian man is the most dutiful servant of all, subject to all. Yeah, we're free, and we're also subject to uh, if we love uh, others. Uh, and that's Paul's point here. So when is something, well, unclean or not kosher? Uh, well, one, when it goes against God's standards. First John 3, 4, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. So we're, we're not talking about doing stuff that's a sin in the Bible. It's just a sin. Stop it. <laughs> if you see your brother who's in sin, you who are spiritual should go to him and try to restore him. Matthew 18, you see a brother in sin, you go to him. You know, Of course, we have the warning to make sure we're removing the plank out of our own eye so that we can help remove uh, the speck out of our brother's eye. But that's not what we're talking about here. That, that is an issue. It's a different issue. Uh, something is unclean when it involves not doing the right thing. James 4, 17, therefore, to him who knows to do good and doesn't, does not do it to him, it's sin. Sins of, of omission, of commission when we do it, sins of omission. Things we should be doing that we're not doing, but that's not what we're talking about. Those things are unclean. But the third one, Paul's point in, in verse 14, the second half uh, but to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it's unclean. So when it violates my conscience, then it's unclean. Well, that doesn't bother me. It does me. <laughs> you know. Well, I don't mind seeing a, a, a show rated this. Uh, I can't, because to me it's it's beyond my conscience. I I just can't I uh, can't do it. It would be if you can do that. It doesn't bother. God bless you. But to me it would be a, a sin. And Paul's saying 
And we need to kind of be okay with that. We don't have to talk somebody else into our own personal convictions uh, is the idea. Uh, fourthly, as we attempt to walk in love, we must focus on the kingdom of God. And certainly this is uh, very key to everything. Verse 17, where he says, For the kingdom of God is, is not this stuff. It's not eating and drinking and behavioral and what you wear and how you cut your hair and all that stuff. You know, how shiny your shoes are. But it's righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's, that's where the focus is to be on our lives. Jesus kind of encapsulates that in uh, Matthew 6, 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and then all these things will be added unto you. You know, we're just focused on the Lord and the Lordship of Christ and wanting to uh, love him and love others. A lot of these things take care of themselves. Remember, the Pharisees were very focused on externals and how things work. But the kingdom of God is about the, uh, the internal, uh, what's going on in our own hearts. Uh, one of the churches that I was uh, attended as a kid growing up had the opportunity to buy some property and build a uh, uh, build a nice uh, facility and everything, uh, but there was a problem. And the problem was they uh, they had had a great architect and went to the church and designed it all. But when it came to the interior, they figured they would uh, have little committees, you know, and the committees would decide that the color of this, and this committee would decide that. Well, they, apparently, apparently the gals that determined the wallpaper in the women's bathroom, apparently they got it all wrong. We almost had a, a church split over it. I am not kidding. Some people did leave the church over it. Uh, it could have been worse. The wallpaper and the women's bathroom. Kind of a red gold velvet. I guess it was, some people thought that was worldly. I wish they weren't into the Hollywood glam look or whatever. But, uh, you know, there's another church I heard about. It's a big fight over because they, they moved the piano. The piano had always been on this side. And then it got moved to this side because they had some other side. Oh, man, people left the church. You kidding me? You can't move that piano. Uh, crazy stuff. Uh, that's why, <laughs> you know, it, these things, things happen. I, uh, uh, when, I, when I used to build stained glass windows for a living, I did quite a few churches, uh, and, and sometimes they're the worst. I mean, I, I love do doing them because of the fact that I could, uh, well, I could do Christian art, which stained glass is considered. It's going to change, but traditionally it's a Christian art form, one of the only truly Christian art forms. And, uh, and uh, it was uh, you know, exciting to do the churches because these are kind of sizable windows and stuff. And... Uh, and, uh, and, uh, but I would have to meet with their boards uh, to make these determinations. And you talk about the designing and colors and all this stuff, and these guys would go around and around and around with each other. Well, I'm not, I, I can't agree, because you know, last month when we wanted to uh, do this in the fellowship hall, you didn't want to uh, you know, fund the new tablecloths, and so I think it's like, I'm just going, I'm glad I'm here as a Christian, uh, and there's not a non-Christian that's getting this job, because I wouldn't want to hear them to see all this and hear all this. It was. Uh, some of them was pretty, pretty bizarre. It was okay if it was just like one guy. He's the guy. You like it? We're, we're good. Uh, crazy. I, uh, <laughs> when uh, I was on staff with Pastor Bill and, and still building windows, I wanted to do a little window for the uh, Empress Theater when they were downtown there on Duwano. So <clears throat> I just did it the easy way. I measured the window and uh, went home and designed it, knocked it out in a couple of, couple of three days. And then I went in at night. I have the key, shut the alarm off. I have a friend with me who installed the window, nice little oak frame around it, reverse, set the alarm, key, leave. Come to work the next day, hey, there's a stained glass window over. Oh, wow, where did that came from? No, did you do that? Yeah, but you know, you don't have to have it. I, I, I have it out tonight if you don't like it. You know, you like it? Oh, we love it. That was the easier way to go, as opposed to, what colors do you, are you thinking of? Because I'm thinking about, see, I didn't even want to go there. <laughs> Disputable matters. It was the easy way. It's crazy. It's crazy what we get caught up into in, in, in the church, in the body of Christ. And, and Paul's like, do you remember this thing? It's called kingdom of God, righteousness, peace, the joy of the Holy Spirit. Uh, those are the things that we're supposed to be uh, focused on. Uh, the kingdom of God, he says, is righteousness. Uh, that should produce in our, us a longing for holiness. A desire to know God uh, better. That should be what's on our thoughts. As David said in Psalm 42. As the deer pants for the water brooks. So my soul uh, for you, O God. Uh, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Jesus says in Matthew 5, 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Uh, they will be filled. That's to be our focus. That is uh, followed by peace. Because peace with God 
will lead to peace with uh, others as well. And then the uh, eternal element of joy in the Holy Spirit, the mark that we've been in the presence of God. Uh, also in our attempt to walk in love, uh, we see that uh, it's all about serving Christ. That should be central. Verse 18, for he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. And I love that little statement because it's saying that, you know, when we get this right, uh, these peripheral things don't become issues with us. And we're willing to, uh, <laughs> to, to not walk into tomorrow's. I'm not saying you shouldn't do that. It's, they have a lot of good stuff in there. And, uh, and they're real sweet to us. And we work with them on some deals in terms of keeping the, the back parking lot cleaned up and everything. But I'm just saying, you know, for me, uh, w when we do stuff where we deny ourselves something, maybe something that it's okay, but I'm just not going to do it because I don't want to confuse somebody. That's pleasing to God, Paul says. That's what he's saying. When you, when you, when you do things out of love, uh, it's, it's pleasing to God, and, uh, uh, and I think that's awesome. Uh, and the secondly, we're approved of men. That means that there's other people that are watching our lives, and when they see you treat other people with respect and honor them and love them by not doing something or by doing something for them, you're approved of men. That means people are watching you and think, I think that guy really is a Christian. I think his life really is different because... I wouldn't do that, man. <laughs> I'm selfish. I would just do what I want to do. But he doesn't do what he wants to do. He, he does what he thinks is best for other people. There, there, are, there are ramifications. Uh, people are watching, and it can become a powerful testimony. Our actions uh, impact the lives of others. Uh, we should make every attempt to walk in love. And then it should be our aim to be at peace with others. Verse 19, therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace. And the things by which one may edify another. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All things are indeed pure, uh, but it is evil for the man who eats with offense. Uh, it is good neither to eat meat, nor drink wine, nor do anything by which your brother stumbles, or is offended, or is made weak. So it's our aim to, uh, to be at peace uh, and to try to do the things that uh, edify uh, other people. Uh, to build others up, to be concerned about others. You know, when we, uh, you know, had the, uh, the grandkids come uh, stay with us uh, earlier in the summer. Man, I was, I was two weeks putting child locks on this and moving this. And, uh, you know, we're making all these accommodations, right, for these kids because we love them and we don't want them to get hurt. That, uh, that's what Paul's saying here. Do, do you see someone else that is the weaker? Uh, and can you do like some accommodation so that uh, they're not going to get hurt or, or stumble in their faith in, in any way. Uh, that, that, that's what he's talking about here. Secondly, he says it, it's uh, our aim to live at peace should preclude us from destroying the work of God. Pretty heavy statement here, verse 21. Uh, it is good neither to eat meat or drink wine nor do anything by which your brother stumbles uh, or is, fun, uh, is offended uh, or is, uh, is made work, uh, made weak. <laughs> and uh, so... Uh, so if I'm eating a steak in a restaurant, don't come lay this on me. Just let me finish my steak first. <laughs> now, but you understand what it, it's, uh, yeah, but actually if I thought you were there and I thought it was an issue, I wouldn't order it. You know, it's the idea. Uh, don't, don't do these things. And he covers, covers a couple of biggies here, doesn't he? Uh, uh, eating meat is probably not going to, you probably don't have a lot of Seventh-day Adventist friends that you're really concerned about, but... Uh, uh, you know, hey, the drinking wine, all these things, these are issues. Uh, this, is a, it, this is a very interesting one uh, to me because uh, it's, it's kind of a big thing in the body of Christ today. It used to be a denominational thing. I don't know if you know that. If you wanted to, uh, 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 if, uh, if you weren't going to drink, that meant you could be uh, part of a Pentecostal church because they're in holiness. Uh, if you were going to drink a little, you could be uh, a Baptist because drinking a little is okay. You know, once you're saved, you're always saved. Hope I'm not offending you. I'm just, it's kind of a cultural Christianity. It's because of the 50s and 60s. I'm not making this stuff up. Uh, if you want to drink a little more, often you'd be a Presbyterian because uh, it's okay with them. And then, uh, sorry, I'm going to really. Uh, and then if you want uh, to drink a little more than that, uh, you become a Lutheran because if you got three, three Lutherans, uh, or if you got four Lutherans, you got a fifth. Uh, <laughs> first people are going what's a fifth a fifth of what well it's, it's a measurement of alcohol less than a quart more than a pint i used to sell it I didn't, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, it used to be divided up by denom the denominational thing, but it's different now. I mean, no, it's, 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 it's really becoming prevalent. And, and I think that it's, it's because uh, maybe we just don't teach on that. Maybe people haven't read this or really uh, taken it to, uh, to heart. Uh, yeah, you might have the liberty, I understand, to have a, a beer, a glass of wine uh, once in a while. I, when I was first saved, <clears throat> man, I'd been delivered from drugs. So the idea of, uh, I'm at somebody's wedding and they're passing out beers. Yeah, I'll take one of those, but I'll take the green bottle, not the watered down stuff. You know, I mean, I, I you know, I, I wasn't, I didn't even, as a Christian, I didn't, I was, a, I was a hallelujah, man. I'm not addicted to cocaine anymore. This is like water to me. I don't even think anything of it. I'm hoping I'm not offended anyway, but I just didn't think anything of it. And you know, actually for me at the time, I would say it wasn't sin because it didn't bother my conscience a bit, a bit, but it wasn't a big deal for me. And, um, but then I would be around other people. Now I'm trying to witness to them. And if every time I walk in the door, they're putting a beer in my hand, it's like, oh, I don't think this is good. Because I might stop at one, but they never do. <laughs> and uh, it's, I realized that what I was doing was actually encouraging this behavior. And in some cases, it was a couple of guys that were trying to walk with the Lord. And I just went, Man, their salvation is not worth a beer once in a while. Uh, is that, is that, it just wasn't to me. So it just ended. It just ended. I had a, uh, <clears throat> as long as I'm stepping on toes, I'll just keep going with this. <laughs> but a young, young, young Marine officer, they a wonderful family with us who got to, uh, we did their, uh, he was an Intel guy here. Uh, he, uh, we did their long distance uh, engagement, uh, uh, pre-marriage stuff, and then, and then they, uh, they got married and he went back to the East Coast, they flew back again, uh, got to baptize her, got to dedicate their first child. Man, a lot happened, three years, you know. Uh, but, uh, you know, he came to me after ch church, wonderful couple, and he said, um, no, first, uh, first his wife came to me and said, could you talk to my husband? Sure, what do you want me to talk to him about? <laughs> I get this once in a while. <clears throat> well, you know, he's kind of gotten into stopping at the old club on the way home, having a beer with the boys. Uh, is, that, is that creating problems? So she, she goes, yeah, it really bothers me. Uh, you know, because I just don't know where it's going. And, da, 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 da. and uh, she's concerned. So I, I talked with him. I said, hey, can I talk to you? He says, yeah, my wife talked to you? I said, yes, yeah, she did. <laughs> I said, um, so we, we talked about it a little bit. Really was not an issue for, I mean, it wasn't a problem. Uh, uh, it wasn't really even that often. And uh, so I said, so this really is no big deal, right? He goes, yeah, it's really no big deal. I go, okay, here, here's the issue. Just between me and you, I think your wife is awesome. And she's beautiful. Do you think that? Oh, absolutely. I said, do you think you're like one of the luckiest guys around to have her from? Absolutely. I go, okay, here, here's the deal. I happen to know something you could do that would be a total blessing to her. What's that? Oh, that. Yeah, apparently that'd be a big deal to her. She'd be totally blessed if you'd stop having a beer once in a while with the boys. Because it's no big deal, right? You just told me it's no big deal. But on the other hand, you could do something that would be a total blessing to her. Yes, I could. And he did. And it was. And, uh, and we got to see him on the East Coast and see all of their many children and how well they're doing in a church and serving the Lord. And I, I, I'm not trying to just pick on one issue, but it is an issue. Uh, and sometimes there's things by our actions, our attitudes right, we can change something that not only not stumbles somebody, but actually could be a huge blessing uh, to, to somebody else. And again, uh, this, this whole thing was, man, it was never even an issue when I was a young Christian growing up because we, we got saved out of this stuff. I never, I never thought it would be an issue in the church today. It's a growing problem. Uh, it's a growing issue. I, and, I, and I think it's an issue of love. So if you know somebody uh, and they got a problem with one of these things that we're talking about and it bothers you, just get on their case. No. <laughs> Pray that God would fill them with his love. If they are filled with the love of Jesus Christ, they'll just view things differently. They'll view things differently. Uh, so important. This word good, when he says it's, uh, it is good uh, neither to eat meat or drink wine or do anything, the word good at, at its root can also be translated beautiful. Ken Hughes says this, uh, it is beautiful 
not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else that will cause your brother to fall. Such behavior or thought is beautiful because it shows there's love among the brethren. It is beautiful because arrogance is gone. It is beautiful because it's unselfish. It is beautiful because it means one has a finely tuned sense of spiritual proportion. Recognizing secondary issues for what they are, it is especially beautiful because it puts others first. And that's the idea. That's, that's the Jesus style, is to always put others, uh, others first. You know, if you, we were to go out hiking with, with a group, which you do once in a while, and uh, we do one of two things. Uh, either put the, the slowest person uh, in the front so they can kind of set the pace and nobody gets left behind. And that, that kind of works. The option two is you put one of your strong hikers in the front who really knows exactly where they're going, who's sensitive to the fact that we're in a group. And he's not out to show everybody what, a, what great shape he's in. He's actually out there to clear the way and keep an eye on everybody and keep everybody together. That's, that's the idea here. Uh, if, you're, if you're the weaker person, we're going to just put you up front and, and, uh, and just kind of stay with you. Uh, if you're the, not the weak person and you're the person out front, then, hey, just keep, keep an eye on everybody so we can all stay together here uh, in this thing called the Church of Jesus Christ. Seventh, and I know if you just woke up, that is a shock. You missed uh, the first six points. Uh, we all must live according to our own convictions, verse 22 and 23. Do you have faith? Uh, <laughs> have it to yourself before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself and what he approves, but he who doubts is condemned if he eats, but... Uh, he does not eat from faith, for whatever is not from faith is sin. So again, if uh, <clears throat> we can't borrow our convictions from other people, we can't give our convictions to other people, uh, if doing something is a sin for you, don't do it. Uh, you know, if, uh, if it's okay for you, hey, it's, it's okay for you. Uh, again, what we uh, believe about something very often is a, is a, uh, should be a neutral thing. We want to keep it to ourselves and God. We don't want to, uh, you know, kind of, again, try to drive our convictions down somebody else's throat. Uh, if we're concerned about them, hey, if it's a sin, go talk to them, Matthew 18. Uh, but if it's a doubtful, disputable, different thing, then leave them alone. <laughs> with your personal convictions, but, but, it, but pray for them. Uh, because, you know, God's love uh, can change a lot of things in a person's heart. That's the issue. We're walking in liberty, uh, but the balance of that is, uh, is, is love. And uh, so important that we're able to uh, uh, be loving and accepting of one another and walk that tightrope of our Christian liberty uh, with love. Make sense? These are just principles. I realize I went through, uh, you know, uh, seven of them uh, in two weeks. Uh, when we disagree, and it's not a sin issue, what do we do? Well, it's an attitude check, and then realize our actions uh, affect others. We're going to have differing opinions, but we don't want to. We don't want to divide off and have the cheer, church of the meat eaters and the church of the vegans and the church of the this and the church of the spiked hair and the church of the you know. Uh, three-piece suit and the, you know, we don't want to do that. It's a lot more fun. <laughs> it's a lot more fun being together. Uh, the unity with diversity uh, is, uh, is what uh, Jesus is praying for and what Paul is exhorting us to. And it's, uh, it makes life a lot more interesting. And, uh, and it really uh, is what the body of Christ should be all about. Uh, and, I, and I see that totally seriously. If uh, when somebody shows up in here and they are way different than everybody else, I praise God because it gives us a chance to reach somebody else that might look like them too. But if that person and uh, somebody else walks in and it's like, man, it's nothing but old people in here. I'm out of here, for example. You know, we're, we're in trouble. We're in trouble, you know. Uh, and, uh, you know, whatever, whatever they, they look like, you know, we need to accept them and uh, embrace them uh, because we, we need everybody. If we're going to reach everybody, and I think that's what we want to do. Amen. Comes a day when all was lost will be redeemed. Comes a day when weary hands will be lifted high.
trumpet blast will fill the sky. I'm not a captive. Drown all our sins and come up again, forever changed. Never to. 